great to be here. It's always great to be at Brookings discussing um, uh, weighty uh, and cheerful topics such as this. And I will get into um, questioning our distinguished panel about the broader future of Europe questions. But as a journalist, I can't help leading off from today's news, um, which is about the Conservative Party's leadership election in which a wide and diverse range of white Oxbridge males in favour of hard Brexit um, voted for Boris Johnson um, and I think he got more than number two, three and four in the contest combined. So the next Prime Minister is Boris Johnson and that's perhaps not such big news but it is news. Um, uh, and so I just want to kick off Amanda by asking you whether this therefore means, in the context of the future of Europe, not just Britain's own journey, that a hard no-deal no Brexit is now a probability. I, well, two things. One, I think it's... it's... Do you want to borrow mine? Uh, our, our microphones are working as well as the continent of Europe at the moment. Um, would you like my microphone? Yes. Fog over the English Channel. Okay, I will start again. I, well, I would say two things. One, I think hard Brexit has always been a probability. Uh, and second, uh, lest anybody overinterpret what Ed said, there is still a democratic process to go through in the UK uh, with the further narrowing down of the, the two candidates and then the 120,000 uh, paid up members of the Conservative Party uh, who get to vote for their, their final choice. Uh, it is a rather curious system where they are essentially voting for the Conservative Party leader, but they are effectively voting for the new Prime Minister since the Conservative Party will, will remain in, in government. I, certainly if you look at the, the debates that have been had among the contenders for the leadership, the question really has been uh, who can promote the, the hardest Brexit and who is willing to see the UK crash out with, with uh, no deal. Uh, we here at Brookings hosted a couple weeks ago John Burkow, who's the Speaker of the British Parliament. And one of the questions that we put to him, uh, which is a, a part of the live debate that's going on in the UK, is whether or not Parliament can stop a no deal Brexit. Uh, Boris Johnson, of course, has been a proponent of, of no deal. Uh, he leads a faction of hard Brexiteers that are particularly opposed to the backstop for Northern Ireland. Uh, I think if he could try and find a way to resolve the backstop for Northern Ireland, he would be prepared to go forward with a deal. He is going to, of course, face the same challenges that Theresa May did in the sense that you have a very divided parliament, a very divided country, and an EU that is not prepared to renegotiate its red lines, including the, the backstop so I think the interesting thing to watch is going to be this debate between a, a likely Prime Minister Boris Johnson and a Parliament. The only thing that the British Parliament has managed to agree on with Brexit is that they don't support a no-deal Brexit. And so we're already seeing talk about whether or not Parliament can try and introduce legislation and, and find a way to block that. Uh, the other thing is, is we're simply running out of time. Uh, the UK had gotten a six-month extension. The new deadline for Brexit is Halloween. Uh, the first half of this six-month month period that was supposed to be spent sorting out the domestic position is now being spent on the Tory leadership contest. It's not expected to be finalized until the end of July. Everybody will go on their recess in, in August. Uh, and then we really only have a, a couple of weeks in the fall before we're facing a, a new deadline. Uh, and it ought to be said that you know, Boris's campaign is, I will renegotiate a good exit deal with Europe. But Brussels leaders, he's described as Second World War camp commandants. Um, so that's, that's a, uh, an interesting um, potential negotiation we see there. Um, Yasha, uh, widening the lens. Um, two, two or three years ago, uh, we had Trump early in his administration. We had um, Angela Merkel riding pretty strong. Macron vanquishing Marine Le Pen. Merkel actually being described as leader of the moral superpower. And this idea that Macron and Merkel together could rekindle uh, the Franco-German motor and reform the Eurozone, which is the sort of key existential question, the survival of the Eurozone for the future of Europe, and have a European renaissance, as Macron went on to call it. Um, today, uh, you know, we have populists having done pretty well in the European parliamentary elections. Macron's got the persistence of the whole gilet jaune problem. Um, Merkel is um, a lame duck. Uh, and 
the friction between Germany and France uh, is getting sort of stronger all the time, seemingly. Um, so, so no revived motor there. So when we talk about um, competing visions for Europe, what vision, if any, looking at it um, from a relatively high altitude, do you see having any chance of commanding consensus? Um, well, I think none. Uh, <laughs> what we've seen in the last few years is simply that um, the kind of consensus you need in order to affect any real change in European institutions is very broad. Um, it involves a lot of different countries and a lot of different political forces. And as moderate parties on both the left and the right have been squeezed by the extremes, and as some European countries have been taken over uh, by extremists who are trying to erect dictatorships in parts of Europe like Poland and Hungary, the prospect of actually gaining the kind of broad consensus you need in order to really reform Europe's institutions, um, I think has just proven to be illusory. Now, there's problems on some of the moderate parties as well, as you're pointing out. The idea that France and Germany would come together um, and uh, uh, align on a vision of Europe's future and be able to push them through the European institutions has failed because Macron and Merkel throw probably two of the more simpatico leaders within Europe today with each other have not been able uh, to push that forward nearly as strongly as expected. And frankly, uh, Germany does not appear particularly interested in EU reform. So we're now in the paradoxical uh, situation in which, uh, you know, we're basically trying to keep the institutions on even keel, uh, go bit by bit in a moment in which uh, those institutions are in serious reform. And that seems to be uh, the kind of zombie-like state that the EU will have for the next 10 or 20 years. But I just want to add one other thing, which is that uh, the biggest challenge both to the EU uh, and to European values at this point is not at the EU level, it's at the national level. Um, uh, we can debate exactly how the European Parliament elections went, but uh, far-right populists took the largest share of the vote in Italy, in the United Kingdom, in France, in Poland, in Hungary, and I think in one or two other places that I'm forgetting right now. Um, and we are seeing something that two or three years ago uh, was still doubted by a lot of people, namely that it's possible within the heart of the European Union to undermine democracy to such an extent that you no longer have free and fair elections in Hungary and that Freedom House now considers a member state of the EU, only partly free. And to me, the most dramatic uh, news from the election uh, in Europe was that in Poland, where the opposition was actually doing everything right, where they built a very broad coalition against the governing law and justice party, where they featured a lot of very prominent politicians giving real weight to this election. In the end, law and justice came out a good seven points ahead of the pro-European coalition. And it now looks much more likely than it did a month or two ago that that government will get re-elected in the fall. Now, if the Polish government gets re-elected in the fall, it is very clear that, as Kaczynski has publicly stated, uh, the journey is going in the direction of Budapest. And then you have, essentially, two elected quasi-dictators in the heart of the European Union. And that becomes an existential threat, not just for the people living in those countries, but for the EU itself. Because you can try to justify to Germans why they should uh, share their sovereignty with French citizens or to French citizens why they should share their sovereignty with Danish citizens. But in the long run, it is going to become very, very difficult indeed to convince the citizens of free countries to share the sovereignty with dictators in Budapest or Warsaw. And that's a challenge to the EU, which I think we haven't yet properly confronted. So not, not so much competing visions as a, a sort of surgeon nightmare um, and a zombie center of Europe. Um, uh, just sticking on the zombie center of Europe, um, Yasha's words, hasten to add, not mine. Um, we have Macron still trying to create a sort of European court. Macron perhaps Pedro Sanchez of Spain, but Macron right now is still the best hope of those who have a positive, coherent vision um, for Europe. And he's trying to build um, a centre party in um, the European Parliament. 
uh, which I think uh, he's renamed the, from the Liberals to Renew Europe. But even there, I mean, we have its leader, Natalie Loiseau, um, I believe in the last couple of days, she described her rivals for the leadership. One of them she called an ectoplasm. Is that right? <laughs> Which is an interesting insult. Um, ectoplasm. Another she called an embittered old man. And so that's, that's not going particularly well um, either. Talk, 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 talk to us a little bit about the practicalities of Macron building this Europe Renaissance movement that he, that he wants, still wants to build. So ectoplasm is a beautiful um, insult coming from Tintin directly, uh, from the Captain Haddock. And so that's, uh, it's very French of her, or, you know, European of her to, uh, to use that word. She was also the, the French minister who called her cat Brexit, right? <laughs> yeah. Because it kept, you would couldn't leave, decide whether uh, to go in or out. <laughs> that's brilliant. Um, she was more than controversial during these uh, election campaign, and she probably underperformed uh, for Macron. Uh, Macron came in second in the European election um, campaign after uh, Marine Le Pen's uh, national rally, and uh, partly because he has trouble uh, really identifying with an ideology that um, a lot of French could rally to, and uh, partly also because the, the, the campaign and its uh, leader, uh, Nathalie Loiseau, probably underperformed. Um, the, the story uh, behind Macron and Macron trying to do this uh, liberal group that he prefers to be called Renew Europe, because in French, liberal, liberal has a, a sense of ultra-capitalism hidden behind it. So he was really willing to just get rid of that uh, word. Uh, this effort is very much an effort of not aligning either with the center-right and the center-left as well. So at the same time as it's trying to create a center, is also trying to create a sort of an anti-system center, which is very paradoxical, something that I call extreme center. The extreme center today in Europe is also part of the populist wave. This populist wave um, was very much about changing ideology, providing new radical ideology of a virtuous people against you know, corrupt elite, uh, as the definition of populism is. But uh, there are groups that are now rejecting the sort of corrupt elite as the former political class, the inherited political class of mainstream right-wing parties, mainstream left-wing parties. And Macron came in in 2016 sort of rejecting the entire French political class and making a case for an anti-system system uh, candidate because he's very much at the center of it all. So it's sort of this new version. He has uh, called it at the European level the fight between nationalism and progressives, um, which uh, he's tried to replicate at the national level, so in his own personal fly fight with the national rally. And at the uh, European level, it's uh, the liberals, so Alde now called Renew Europe, this new liberal group at the center, versus the nationalist. So he really wants to be, um, with this group, a force uh, for um, proposal. And he knows that sovereignists and nationalists are very much a force of obstruction with very often very little to offer on the European stage. So he can be his own engine. The problem of that is that the, the story of populism in Europe is also a story of fragmentation. And you can see that both in the European uh, results at a larger, um, larger scale, where both the right-wing and the left-wing bloc together did less than 50% of the vote. And everybody else, whether it's the Greens, the Liberals, the Nationalists, the Sovereignists, the different kinds of Nationalists out there, um, the anti-system or the, the, the populist, the you know, like Five Star in, in Italy... All of this provide very different answers, subtly different or, 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 or in substantively different, but it means it's going to be that much harder to unite, to propose a consensus, to find a way forward for Europe uh, because of this fragmentation. Uh, so, um, Alina, you, you have a great new paper out um, uh, with Benjamin Haddad in, in Foreign Affairs, Europe Alone, it's entitled, um, in which you say that the slow divorce or distancing be between Europe and the United States is going to happen anyway, even almost regardless of Trump. But nevertheless, Trump is very much a pro-cyclical force um, in, in, this, in this situation. Um, and he's encouraging some of the, um, some of the nationalists, anti-Macron 
forces that um, CD was talking about um, very actively. You know, he had um, Orban um, in the White House the other day. He had the president of Poland yesterday. He's got Salvini. I'm not sure they're going to directly meet, but I'm sure there'll be a drop by um, uh, visiting DC next week. Um, to what extent is the um, American president encouraging these these forces of of European disintegration, as it were? Uh, thanks for the easy question, Ed. I really appreciate it. Uh, just, uh, if I may, just uh, <clears throat> respond to some of my colleagues put on the table because I think this is related to to your question about the transatlantic relationship. Uh, one, the the point that Celia just made about the overall effect of the populist turn really being the fragmentation of politics at the EU level and at the national level across Europe, I think is a really profound trend that we should all be watching. Uh, you know, we were talking about the various factions we have in the European Parliament, but I think the bigger picture is this is the most divided European Parliament that we've ever had. There's some good news, I would say, in terms of the uh, ability of the nationalists, the Eurosceptics, uh, to form the nationalist internationalists. The great irony, of course, is that they always fail. Um, just this morning, uh, Le Pen and Salvini announced that they have failed to form a united faction of the three Eurosceptic fac factions in Parliament, which means these parties will not have as much of a force as many had feared. And two-thirds of the Parliament is still pro-European integration and, and generally centrist. So I think that is the good news, is that the nationalists can't get their act together. Um, I think, on the other hand, the great irony is that the Brexit party, which uh, we were, Amanda started talking about, got the same number of seats as the Christian Democrats from Germany. This is quite a shock. But the irony is that now there's concern that with Boris Johnson looking very likely to become the next prime minister and a hard Brexit coming as a result of that, um, the Brexit party will no longer be this great force in the European Parliament because they'll have to exit. As this is just the great, weird, strange irony of how the, the, this whole populist dynamic is reshaping European politics. And I do think that we have focused too much on how much the U.S. president or any U.S. president has had an effect in shaping European dynamics at this level. Um, thank you for plugging the paper. The main argument of that paper is to say, look, the reality is that we all want to say this is a Trump problem, right? Uh, but if we look at the greater scope of the fraying and decoupling of Europe and the United States, Trump is absolutely amplifying that trend. He is absolutely seeing himself much more aligned with the populace than with the centrists. There's no question about that. Just look at the conversations and the comments that the president has made about Chancellor Merkel, for example. But at the end of the day, this is an internal European problem. And the trends and the turn of towards populism, towards the right, has been there for decades. We just haven't been paying very much attention to it. Swap mic, friends. Um, thank you, Celia. Um, uh, let, let's just um, stick for a second to the Brexit thing. If Britain leaves, um, we're then left with perhaps a, a sigh of relief amongst many Europeans, Macron being in the front of the queue, that the Brexit headache is no longer directly one Europe can, can influence, um, in spite of what I imagine will be the economic um, uh, hit that Europe will also take from a, from a hard deal Brexit, no deal Brexit. Um, but nevertheless, it will leave Europe alone with its problems. Um, and Brexit will no longer sort of be one of them. And I think that this side of the Atlantic, to a great degree, as each of you in your way has been conveying, um, uh, Brexit has been given way too much attention and Europe's other problems perhaps too little. Um, and chief of these problems um, is reforming Europe to make it viable and, and legitimate in the eyes of European voters, of European people. Amanda, looking at that sort of post-Brexit scenario, um, how do you see this playing out? Where, where, where is Europe going to go, with or without Trump helping things along? The first thing I would say, I guess, is, is quibbling a little bit with the, the is this working? <laughs> I, the, the first thing I would say is, is 
quibbling a, a tiny bit with the, the, the first part of your question because I don't think Brexit is going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, it was a hypothetical question. Even to, st to stay you onto Europe's other problems. I but know, you can talk I about know. Brexit. I will, I'll, just, I'll just make one, one brief comment on that. I mean, I, it, it really is, is only the, the end of the beginning uh, because whether or not there is a deal or a no deal, the UK still needs to engage with, with the rest of the European Union. There's political, economic, and, and security interests. And I think most people believe that even if there is a hard Brexit, uh, the question is how long it will take the UK to come back to the EU to try and negotiate some sort of future framework. And the EU has already been clear that if they do negotiate those things, the UK is going to have to accept much of what is in the current agreement anyway in terms of paying its bills, uh, dealing with citizens' rights, and addressing the, the border in, in Northern Ireland. So uh, lest, lest anybody think this is going to be wrapped up one way or the other in, in October, I think Brexit is going to be with us for, for a very long time. Uh, on your, your... Yay. Sorry? <laughs> that's, that's something to look forward to. Uh, yes. Um, on, on the, the, the broader question, I mean, I, I, I think Alina is right that there, there have been trends in, in terms of, of moving in different directions. I mean, the big thing that you often hear coming up in this, this Trump debate is you start to get into these questions of European strategic autonomy, questions about whether or not Europe is able to do more for itself. Uh, but at the same time, you look at what Europe is dealing with, and in the last couple of years, you have had the financial crisis, which has called into question one of Europe's central tenets, which is the idea of a single currency. And alongside that, you had the migration crisis, which called into question another of Europe's central tenets, which was this idea of, of free movement. And then you have the, the broader defense spending debate, which Trump has certainly crystallized, but is an issue that, that numerous presidents uh, before him have, have raised. Uh, and it's clear that Europe is not going to have the capacity in the, the near future to be able to spend a sufficient amount of money and have a sufficient amount of capabilities to be able to defend itself. Uh, and as Yasha was saying, you also have very deep divisions within the, the countries themselves. Uh, so I think Trump has been heightening a lot of these problems, has been raising questions for the Europeans. Another concern, I think, on the European side is that they don't really seem to have a, a plan B strategy uh, beyond the, the re-election of Trump, which I think is going to heighten these trends even further. Uh, the inclination in Europe right now seems to be, you know, we're over halfway through the term. Things have been bad, not quite as bad as they could be. Let's just hold on until November 2020. Uh, and the challenge, I think, is if Trump is, is re-elected, it's going to force them to have to start making some very difficult decisions. Uh, in terms of their own internal capacities and in terms of, of how they strategically align themselves that they have not been making to date, and I think they have been avoiding for the first term of Trump's presidency. Okay, well, let's talk. Yeah, yeah sure. Well, I, I just want to, again, double-click on the domestic element of this. I think it's important to think about the European dim dimension and the way in which it impacts the relationship with the United States, but it's also important to just remember what this actually means for the level at which power still retains remains most, most immediate and potent, and that's the national state level. I mean, the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom now essentially faces a choice between uh, making a sensible, real, serious person prime minister and potentially having the Brexit Party eat its lunch at the next general election or making Boris Johnson prime minister. <laughs> and they've decided to make Boris Johnson prime minister by the looks of it. Um, but this means that the Conservative Party of the United Kingdom, for the moment, is essentially transforming itself into a populist party, led by somebody who has not just engaged in all kinds of irresponsible rhetoric against various EU leaders and so on, um, but has essentially argued whatever he thought was most fun and most provocative at every stage of his career from when he was a correspondent in Brussels often making up things about the EU to the night on which he had written out a speech in favor of Brexit and a speech against Brexit and decided to jump on the anti-Brexit and the pro-Brexit bandwagon because it's the most fun thing to argue. Um, so the fact that on the back of a strategy, Boris Johnson has now finally succeeded in conquering the British political system and is going to be 
shaping the nature of domestic British politics is very worrying in itself, and it's going to extend and have impacts beyond Brexit. In 2010, there was a poll in Britain which asked people to name the most important issue facing the country. 0.5% of Brits talked about the European Union or about something like Brexit. 0.5%. So the fact that all of this emotional energy could be invested in Brexit, that it nearly has destroyed the two parties that have dominated the British political system for 100 years, is not because Brits care so passionately about their relationship with Europe. It's that the anti-establishment sentiment, it's that the sentiment against immigrants, it's that the sentiment against the shortcomings of a political system is now as intense in Britain as it is in many other countries in North America and Western Europe. And that is going to stay with us, not just for the next 17 years it'll take to figure out the relationship between Britain and the EU, as Amanda has pointed out, it'll stay with us for a long time in every other aspect of policy. And I think we have to take that prospect very seriously. Uh, I I should mention, I've known Boris for about 30 years. You mentioned his period in Brussels as a Daily Telegraph um, correspondent. I was a stagiaire, a trainee at the European Commission at the time, and I used to make meet him occasionally in the Kitty O'Shea Irish pub, um, where he might well have been embellishing stories. And his target audience was Daily Telegraph readers, retired colonels, as a stereotype, living in the home counties, um, who wanted to be fed with sort of stories of uh, the ludicrosity of um, European bureaucracy. That is now the, concert- the 120,000 members of the Conservative Party. Its average age is 72. The Tories used to have 2.7 million members. They've now got 120,000. And these people are going to decide the next prime minister, which will be Boris, and the strategy with which he leaves Europe. It's quite an extraordinary change in 30 years. So let me just take this back, though, to, you know, longer-term Europe, which is not going to include Britain. Um, We've got a hugely important summit um, next week, the European Council Summit, in which they've got to make really big decisions to choose the next president of the European Commission. Um, to choose the next head of the European Central Bank, and all all sorts of big appointments of the big figures for the next several years. And again, there are Franco-German frictions over who this would be. So uh, um, the Germans, Angela Merkel wants uh, Manfred Weber, the head of the European People's Party in the Parliament, somebody who's only really been a legislator to be the president of the European Commission. And they also have their own preferred candidate to be head of the European Central Bank. Both of these are really important decisions. Uh, the first, um, the, the president of the European Commission, because this is, this is a person who, depending on who it is, could reestablish um, the legitimacy of European institutions if this is a good politician, or if they're not, could further um, see a further withering away of any interest in who it is who runs Europe. Um, what do you expect is going to happen? Is it going to be Manfred Weber? And if it is Manfred Weber... Is that bad news for Europe to replace uh, Juncker? Uh, so I really don't have a clue uh, who is this going to be. However, I, I can tell you that for Angela Merkel, it's going to be difficult not to uh, push forcefully for uh, Manfred Weber. Uh, being a German of her own party, uh, it makes all the sense in the world. And so hope that she would be... F- pushing for consensus candidates, uh, taking into account maybe the Liberals and Macron, um, I think is, uh, is just, uh, it's not realistic at this point. However, there will be a power play, and uh, a lot of things will be discussed at that point, including all the other appointments. I do believe there's a story, a larger story for these elections, which is the story for the demands of change. And change can take many forms. Change can be a radical change in terms of ideology. So that's what the nationalists are pushing for. They just want um, uh, a, a different uh, non-establishment uh, radical ideology at the European level uh, that is pushing the idea of a Europe of nations, uh, that is not pushing for more integration, but just for common projects and, and nationalist sovereign borders. Uh, and then there's another story, uh, a, a story for, for change of system. 
there is a chronic underrepresentation of Europeans at the European Union level. Um, that has that comes from the fact that um, there, there's a feeling that there whatever the, the European voters vote in their national election or at the European elections, they do they are not in a position of affecting change. They are not in a position of changing the trajectory, the budgetary trajectory trajectory of the European Union, for example. They are not in a power of profoundly shifting the EU towards a more uh, greener side or uh, to uh, on the migration case to really uh, change the conversation. And this frustration is building up and that's what's pushing more marginal, more radical parties at the European level as well. But um, what's impressive as well is, is one figure that I think really struck me was that in France 17% of French voters voted for parties that did not make it through the threshold of 5% for representation. It means that 17% of French voters went to the polls, picked somebody that they knew would not have representation at the EU level. And that number of 17 has been increasing. It was 8% in 1999, and then 10% five years later, 12, 14 the last time. And now it's up to 17%. And so there's an increasing higher choice to just vote true to your values or to what you believe this should be, even though knowing your vote has no importance will have no representation. There's a form of nihilism in, in this choice, but uh, it's a form of a protest vote as well. But that is hardly discussed at the European uh, level. So I think what, what should be fair, what should be the conversation for uh, next week is not whether you know the conservatives are able to impose their lead candidate or the social democrats can make you push as a sort of a consensus candidate. But a conversation on what type of, of people, maybe an outsider, would be really representative of the huge variety of what's going on in, at the EU level. Yeah, sure, sorry. Um, and Alina, can I just jump in here really quick? Oops. Sorry. Um, ju just to follow up on what uh, Celia just said, I think I didn't expect to be sort of the, the positive uh, person on this panel, c c given that I work on, on populism in Europe. Uh, but I do think that uh, the positive outcome of that is this, this conversation is testament to that, that we're actually talking about European politics at the EU, which, you know, five years ago, which was the last European parliamentary elections, they just... We w I don't think we would have had such a deep, intense, I think, emotional conversation about this. So what we're experiencing now is what should have been happening, but it's only ha for some time, but it's only happening now, which is this politicization of European politics, right? At a level that we're used to in national politics that we really haven't seen before at the EU level. And to me, that signals that, in fact, um, the EU and the European Parliament has become a much more important player, and we're seeing, we saw this in the turnout uh, percentages. This was the highest turnout that we've ever seen for European parliamentary elections. That means the idea of Europe is penetrating uh, the mindset of the European public, finally. And this really wasn't the case before. And I think the, the good effect of Brexit is that, if you remember, that after the referendum, there were all of these articles being written about the Oxid and the, and the Grexit, or you know, whatever you want to call it. That has completely stopped. None of these populist parties, the Frexit, right? Uh, Le Pen has not mentioned that. It's been quiet, right? Because Brexit has been such a disaster that the positive outcome of that is that it has consolidated support for the EU, and we see this over and over now in polls, uh, in continental Europe. It has ended any conversations about new... Uh, political parties or countries leaving the EU. And, and now we're having a real conversation about EU politics, which I think was unheard of not that long ago. So I think that in the long term, I still feel quite optimistic that some of these forces that are uh, contributing to these difficult, conflictual questions about European identity and the future of Europe and fragmentation and zombie paralysis, whatever you want to call it, um, are actually leading to the outcome that we're having finally a real debate about what it means to be uh, an EU citizen in Europe. Uh, f first, I just want to say that my microphone works and I'm not giving it up. Um, uh, that's a good laugh from over there, all right. Um, uh, look, I, I, I can't let the, the, the name Manfred Weber pass without saying my strong opinion, because I think it really indicates 
everything that is wrong with uh, mainstream politics in Europe at the moment. So we had these elections, which were styled and hyped, I think, in many cases, in a slightly exaggerated way, as this sort of question of the fate of Europe. Um, that these elections will really show whether the centre can hold against the populists. I'm a little sceptical of that because I think the national elections are much more important than European ones, but it was clearly a deeply symbolic vote. And who does the biggest faction of traditional moderate parties in the European Parliament nominate? Somebody who is not just, frankly, a very provincial politician about whom members of his own party have said to me in private that he is deeply unimpressive and, frankly, incapable. Uh, not the sharpest really tool in the box was one of the more polite things that people said. But somebody who is probably more guilty than just about anybody else in Europe for ensuring that Fidesz, the party of the aspiring and perhaps not just aspiring anymore, dictator in Hungary remained for so long a member of the European People's Party. So our response, our vision for who to put up at a moment when you see figures like Le Pen and Salvini and Orban starting to be more and more dominant in Europe is to put up the kind of boring, mediocre, excuse me, shitty apparatchik that European parties have been able to get away with for 50 years would, would while you, everything was business as usual. Would you go, go so far as to call him an ectoplasm? <laughs> Please, I have standards. I wouldn't uh, deign to go as low as that in my language. I'm okay. willing to swear, but ectoplasm is a little far. So, yeah, I mean, you pick up on a very good point and you make it very forcefully about the importance um, of the next president of the European Commission and how that challenge might be being ducked. But... Arguably, even more important is who's going to head the European Central Bank, um, which you know is is the holds the keys to the future of the eurozone, um, the bifurcation of the eurozone between Club Med countries and the Nordic plus Germany um, plus plus the Dutch, has been very very deep. Arguably, the, the post two thousand eight crisis wouldn't have happened if the ECB had handled it differently. And yet we might be getting a German handpicked candidate who thinks that there was too much quantitative easing and there's been um, too much monetary um, relaxation um, by the ECB and that we should go back to the straitjacket, what I like to call the sado-monetarist approach to, um, to, to, to the Eurozone. Um, uh, this is arguably way more important than anything else. If we're talking about existential crises in Europe, the viability of the Eurozone, this is what Italian politics is about. Now, I'll throw this out to all of you. Um, to, to, to what degree is the future of the Eurozone um, going to be determined by who's selected next week um, at the European Council meeting? So the, there, there's a paradox here, is that the, you mentioned two models, the Club Med and the Nordic model. And I think the uh, the... the the sort of uh, Southern Europe type of vision has been clearly underrepresented um, because it's disunified and it has not been able to uh, push for uh, whatever it's supposed to stand for. And it's, it's going to just continue in that trend because you have very different government at the moment. You have a far-right populist coalition in Italy. You have the uh, liberal centrist Macron in France. You have uh, the socialists in Spain. You have uh, the Greek going on for their own elections. So there's a sort of in, uh, complete uh, uncertainty on the ideological um, destination of this grouping that should have been or could have been a sort of an answer to German austerity and a more uh, market-oriented Nordic model. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's their fault of, for not uh, finding a way, but also it uh, does feed into this idea that the EU is controlled elsewhere, that somehow, you know, all this uh, population, Southern Europe, population um, cannot find a way to push it for its own uh, 
uh, interest, and it leads, um, you know, status quo immobilistic forces uh, sitting in particular in Germany uh, with the, 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 the power of just sit there and not change anything because change is hard, change needs consensus, needs uh, uh, needs uh, a political will, needs to be driven by somebody, and the fact of this disunity really just prevents that. Uh, Alina or Amanda, or anybody, but um, you two, um, your views on whether there is a possibility for rebuilding of a European left. I mean, Silvia just mentioned San Pedro Sanchez in Spain. Um, and um, I guess we've still got Matteo Renzi in, in Italy, though he's not done particularly well recently. Um, we've got these Greek elections coming up with the Syriza party. Um, without a, a centre-left that's strong you're not going to get um, Macron leading any kind of counterbalancing force to what you call the sort of immobilist German um, position. What, what are the prospects for a, a rebooted, revitalized centre-left? And I should quickly mention, not to cram too much in, um, that the Danish elections recently, the far right did pretty badly, partly because the Social Democrats stole a lot of their clothing on immigration I think the untold story of the rise of the right in Europe is the collapse of the central left, uh, which to my mind, the populist right has very much been the symptom of that collapse of the center left. Because if you look at who's been voting for the populist right, it's the traditional constituency, not just, but a lot of the traditional constituency of the central left parties. And this trend, I don't see abating anytime soon. Uh, we saw it very clearly in the European parliamentary elections just now, and those tend to reflect national elections, obviously. So to answer your question, I don't see uh, a real potential for a real rebuilding of a central left. I see more fractionalization. I see potentially you know, more green parties, which have been doing incredibly well across Europe. We haven't mentioned that. Um, more uh, extreme leftist parties that are populist left uh, emerging. And frankly, I see more Italy's than France's in Europe's future. Um, so that's just to kind of undermine my optimistic note earlier. But I do think that the broader trend lines, um, if we just look at elections over the last 20, 25 years or so, clearly signal a continued dissipation of the center left and a continued fragmentation with the fringes kind of taking the air out of the center. Um, either Amanda or Yasha. Yasha. Oh, you've got a working mic. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the, um, uh, I, mean, I think it's really weird in the debate about the left in Europe that we tend to tell all of these separate stories. So on the one hand, there's the decline of the Social Democratic Party. That's story number one. Uh, on the second thing, there's the sort of rise of the far left, where I think that's actually hugely overhyped. What's really fascinating about the last year or so is the collapse of the far left. You see Tsipras likely to be voted out at the next parliamentary elections. You see Podemos stagnating in Spain. And even for Jeremy Corbyn, through the strange uh, bizarreties of a British political system, may still become prime minister, he is incredibly unpopular. Whereas two or three years ago, there was a real popular movement for him, a lot of young people being very excited about him. That moment has completely passed. In a recent poll a couple of days ago, asked whether they would want the outgoing prime minister, Theresa May, the leader of your position, Jeremy Corbyn, or don't know to be prime minister, Jeremy Corbyn came in third behind Theresa May and don't know with about 20% of the preferences. So that is not a rising far left. Um, and what you have as a third story is the rise of green and to some extent liberal parties. Now that's been hyped over the last few weeks as a counter narrative to the populist rise. Oh look, the story of a populist rise is exaggerated because here are these lovely green parties rising. That's a complete misunderstanding of what's going on. What has happened is that the main dividing line of European politics has moved from the economy to culture. And once culture is the main dividing line of politics, you get the far-right populist rising on the one hand, and the most clear, straightforward, cosmopolitan, uh, open world, open society parties on the other hand. That can take the form of something like Macron in France. It can take the form of something like the Green Party in Germany, of something like the Lib Dems or the Greens in the United Kingdom, but it's all of the, of the same piece. Now, what this leaves out is the kind of working class voters that used to vote for the center-left for a lot of European history. 
And so therefore, the overall left coalition has continued to shrink. Despite the wonderful success of the Green Party in Germany, when you add together the Green Party and the Social Democrats, or the Green Party and the Social Democrats and the left party, they did a lot less well this year round than they did five years ago at the European Parliament elections. And so the only way that the left will ever win majorities again in Europe is, whether you like it or not, by following something like the Danish strategy, where you have some parties that clearly cater to a cosmopolitan, urban, highly educated, younger electorate, but you also have a social democratic party that's actually fighting for those working class voters that for many of the last elections had voted for the far right. That's how uh, the Danes have been able to build a left-wing coalition that actually gains a majority, unless other European countries follow suit on that, and that doesn't seem particularly likely at the moment, I think you'll continue to see the weakness of the left and the strength of the far right. Cecilia, briefly, then we'll go to audience questions, or you don't have to be that brief. I'll be brief. Uh, so I disagree. I, <laughs> I don't think the, 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 the overall uh, fragmentation of EU politics is mostly driven by a cultural uh, aspect. I think the economic question is still at the heart of uh, the mobilization. What is true is that the typical left-right divide has profoundly shifted. What is true is that center-right and center-left policy recipes have been um, uh, have lost ground tremendously and that people are more and more unwilling to belong to these uh, consens consensus-forming sort of centrist mainstream platforms. But what we have learned, in, in particular in France with the Yellow Vest Movement protest, is that, is that there is a profound demand for fiscal and social justice that is still at heart of the mobilization of uh, a lot of Europeans. Yes, there is the migration uh, a question, which is partly, and I think only partly, a cultural um, a question, a question of identity, a question of for Europeans uh, to finding their place in this world. But at heart, there is also the question of this uh, financial globalization, which for the past 20 years has really uprooted many uh, Europeans, has really uh, created competition nationally and internationally, uh, for which uh, Europeans are very ill-prepared, and for which they are seeking answers. And whoever is providing the best radical answer, once again, I think they're, they're demanding change. H or whoever is willing to just take on the system. And that's why, you know, they push for a protest movement like the Yellow Vest, who in the end don't have any political representation, but they are just uh, asking for direct democracy or participatory democracy or any form of um, innovation that would shake up the system. It is also partly why uh, someone as astute as Emmanuel Macron is able to understand there is there's a need for to be a slightly anti-system. That's why he offered to um, to to um, uh, cancel the uh, the French top administrative school, uh, which forms all the elites. He understands this anti-elite sentiment. Uh, even though by his ideology it's very hard for him to answer any of it. But I think at the heart of it, there is still the question of social justice and fiscal justice, and it, it will keep coming back. I just don't think it's too fragmented. It hasn't taken hold in one camp or the other. Uh, uh, interesting point. Um, so we've got, about, um, we've got about sort of 12 minutes or so for questions. Um, please... Keep your questions short. State who you are. No biography or life history, please. As, and, and a quick, um, sort of to the point question. Uh, uh, my, my, these two gentlemen here. And so the first, my, Mike, a mic for Mike. Uh, Michael Mosset, a question for Amanda. Can you talk directly about what's going to happen with the House of Commons? They voted about 20 times against various things, but they've never created a majority for anything. And one of their major against is against a hard Brexit. Plus, as the other speakers have already alluded to, the British Labour Party is trying to straddle the greatest issue that's faced the United Kingdom since World War No, no pressure. 
I, yeah, thank you for the, the question. I have written many pieces on, on the Brookings blog if you want all of the, the, the weedy details on, on all of this, but I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's really difficult. Parliament has voted three times on the deal that Theresa May de, de, negotiated with the European Union. It was voted down all three times. Uh, they have done a series of indicative votes to try and see if they could identify majority support for an alternative way forward. The only thing, as I said, that has gained majority support, although it was quite narrow, is for a no-deal Brexit, uh, which, as as Ed said, is something that Boris Johnson has said that he will be willing to consider. Uh, and there's now a discussion within the parliament about whether or not they could introduce some sort of legislation to prevent the government from going forward with a no-deal Brexit. So in terms of, of how this is going to play out, you know, the next uh, six weeks really are going to continue to be devoted to the conservative leadership challenge. Uh, August is traditionally a, a parliamentary recess in the UK, and so then they will come back in, in September. All of the conservative contenders have indicated that they are prepared to go back to Brussels and try and negotiate a better deal. The thing that all of them disagree with is this backstop for Northern Ireland. Uh, and the backstop really is the, the crux of the problem with Brexit, which is that the UK at a certain point needs to decide how closely it is going to stay aligned in economic and regulatory terms with the European Union. The more closely it stays aligned, the easier it is to maintain a frictionless border with Northern Ireland but it's going to make it harder for them to negotiate more expansive free trade agreements with countries like the United States. And so a lot of the wrangling that we have seen over these last couple of years has been an attempt to try and square an impossible circle. Uh, so it is very likely that Boris is not going to be able to negotiate a, a better deal. Uh, f European leaders are increasingly fed up with this debate. Uh, Macron was, was pushed into agreeing to a much longer extension than he even wanted. Uh, so there will be questions about whether or not the UK tries to get a longer extension in October. If they end up trying to go for a no-deal Brexit, you're going to have Parliament likely continuing to push back on that. And as I mentioned earlier, even if you end up with a no-deal Brexit, the UK is likely going to be forced by the European Union to accept a lot of these provisions, uh, including dealing with the border, paying its bills, and dealing with citizens' rights to be in a position to negotiate their future relationship. Uh, so there are questions as to whether or not, you know, the country would be forced into having a referendum, uh, which I think is difficult, partly, as you say, because Jeremy Corbyn has, has been walking a very fine line on this. People in his party are quite supportive of it. He has remained quite skeptical. Uh, or whether you end up having a, a general election. Uh, and then that, of course, leads to the possibility of a Corbyn government, and as we've been discussing, could end up leading to quite fragmented results uh, yet again. So cheerful horizon. Uh, the gen a gentleman here um, was next, I think. Get Thank quick you. question. We haven't got that much time. Yeah, Larry Checo. I, I think he's spoken around, but immigration and populism seems to be, there seems to be a strong correlation between the two. And if Europe is struggling at, to this point with it, what's going to happen 15, 20 years ago when we, got, we start seeing climate change immigration? Right now, we're seeing a lot of economic, uh, you know, movement, but it's going to be overrun. Um, how how is Europe going to handle that? And if it's having trouble now? Well, I will just say this: there's a kind of uh, myth in European politics, which virtually every mainstream politician subscribes to, by the way, which is to say that um, there's no way of controlling our borders because of Europe's huge coastline. Um, so what we should do is to send a lot of money to Africa to help African countries develop, and that will give people a reason to stay at home, and that's the best thing we can do to manage migration. I think that story is not serious. It's not serious for two reasons. The first of which is that actually when you look at what uh, researchers on migration have found is the level of GDP per capita at which countries send most emigrants, uh, Africa is currently below it. A lot of people in Africa who would love to escape the difficult conditions they're facing don't have the money to go to Europe. And obviously, we should be sending money to Africa and helping those countries develop. Obviously, we should be helping these people escape terrible economic conditions. But the idea that that will stem the emigrant flow is illusory. The other piece of this, which is a myth, is that when I was doing uh, a, a radio documentary for the BBC about the huge area of Europe that is now ruled by populists. You can drive along 
the old line that Winston Churchill talks about, from Szczecin in the north to Trieste in the Adriatic, there's now a populist curtain. Um, and when I was in the city of Trieste, I, I was struck by the fact that Salvini is so popular in Italy in part because he has actually delivered for Italians in one specific respect. He has barred ships from landing in Italy. He has led some people to drown in the Mediterranean. But as a result, Italy is no longer getting as many immigrants as it was. And so I think the question of climate change and migration is a little besides the point, because a lot of people want to come to Europe anyway. And in one way or the other, I think Europe will end up fortifying its borders in such ways that they can't stay, come in and they can't stay. Um, and, and climate change is just one additional little push on that. But I think even if you take climate change out of the picture, that is in one way or another uh, where Europe is likely to be headed. Uh, the lady here. Uh, my name is Lucia Cannon, and I have a question for uh, Yasha Monk. And uh, you were talking about Poland and about the European elections and how opposition was so pro-European and democratic, and uh, they lost the election. And I wanted to say that actually the opposition party elected as the representatives to the European Parliament the three most notorious communists in Poland. One is the son of a Soviet military intelligence colonel. The other one was involved in the Moscow loan. The third one was involved in another scandal that, you know, he was recorded saying terrible things. And actually, this party, the Civic Union, has become a post-communist party. It's a party of communist oligarchs. So I don't see, you know, how they'll get support in Poland or, or how you can uh, sort of term them as being democratic. So what's, really. what's your question? Uh, well, well, I wanted it's, it's you to clarify it. And another question is, you know, how is Poland a, a dictatorship? I mean, the fact that they lowered the retirement age from 75 to 65 for some Stalinist judges doesn't really constitute a dictatorship. Well, we, here, here we have lovely exhibit A of the way in which uh, European public discourse is divorcing itself from reality. The idea that civic platform, which is a center-right party, uh, filled uh, with people uh, like Radek Sikorsky, who, uh, whatever conspiracy theories about it, runs Bilderberg, not exactly uh, the most famous communist uh, organization in the history of the world, uh, is somehow secretly beset with old Stalinists who are trying to crush the capitalist system. Uh, it's just deeply unserious. But it is the precise rhetoric that the Polish law and justice government is uh, pushing every day, and not just through government spokesmen, not just through what ministers and what Kaczynski is saying, but on, for example, the state television channel that they have completely captured, from which they have purged journalists who have appeared on it for decades uh, because they don't like the ideology. When I was in Szczecin and I turned on the television, I saw four or five uh, uh, news reports, one after the other, praising uh, the government talking about how wonderful uh, it is um, uh, saying that uh, the opposition is trying to push LGBT ideology on our school children and it is incredibly dangerous and it will undermine Poland. So when you look at the reports that the European Parliament has published on what is happening to the judiciary in Poland, to state media in Poland, to a lot of the independent institutions in the country, when you look at the fact that Kaczynski has openly said that he wants to emulate the Budapest model in Poland. Unfortunately, they are being very successful. They are well on the way there. Um, and these upcoming elections in the fall are likely going to determine the fate of Polish uh, democracy. And no, uh, communism is not returning to Poland uh, if people like Radek Sikorski uh, had more power there. That is uh, simply ridiculous. Th thank you, Asha. A final question. We've got a couple of minutes left. So machine gun, staccato question. Jeff Stacey, uh, keeping it brief... A lot of Western European pessimism, but uh, seems to be some Central European optimism. Eight different countries have either serious protests or have elected non-populists. Opposed to the Danish model, how about the Slovakian model? And aren't they leading the way these days, Central Europe versus Western Europe? Uh, Alina, would you like to take that? Yeah, I will just... Uh, to, to go back to what, uh, this conversation we're having about the fate of Central Eastern Europe, um, one, uh, and I think Yash and I probably disagree on this, is you know I think what's happening across 
Europe, and primarily in Central Eastern Europe, is a crisis of liberalism. It's not a crisis of democracy. Uh, these political movements, uh, political parties, were elected through democratic processes. And yes, once they got there, including uh, Fidesz, including law and justice, they have taken some concerning steps uh, to roll back some of the democratic institutions. And Brookings uh, wrote a report on this, and I'm seated actually with a co-author here, um, looking exactly at these issues. And it's troubling, but we shouldn't conflate the two uh, meaning liberalism and democracy is meaning the same thing, and you know have our hair up uh, in the air burning uh, simply because these countries are uh, responding to what I do think are real grievances in their population. I mean, you know, populist parties don't just come out of the blue. People vote for them, and they vote for them for a reason. And still, I think the story of Central Eastern Europe is an incredibly positive one. If we look at the transformation of these countries from the fall of the Berlin Wall until now, yes, we're in a moment of potential retrenchment or some uh, concerning trends in dem democratic movements, but calling Poland and Hungary a dictatorship, I think goes far, far too far. Um, so, so we do disagree on that, and I, and I want to just briefly uh, respond to that because it's an important point. I think that there has been some conflation of policies by Hungarian and Polish governments and attacks on institutions. Uh, I may personally not like the stance that Hungary has towards immigration, but that is a legitimate thing for the Hungarian government to pursue with the consent of uh, some of its voters. Um, but when you see in Hungary, when I was in Chopron uh, in March, and you ask people, what's your opinion of a government? And they say, look, I'm willing to tell you privately, but I don't want to be quoted uh, on air. I, don't, I want to, to take your microphone away. And when you do that, and you say, why? And they say, look, if I tell you what I think about the government, I might lose my job tomorrow. And you ask them, how come? Do you work for the government? Do you have some kind of public position? And say, no, I work for a private company, but it does a lot of business with the city and so on, and it's going to lose those contracts if somebody who's an employee at that company is quoted as criticizing it. When you see Freedom House, which is just down the road here, classifying Hungary as partly free because opposition parties are being severely restricted in the kind of work they are able to do, because the Electoral Commission has been conquered by the ruling party in such a way that uh, each of the opposition parties has to pay huge fines for spurious offenses, while the governing party is not investigated for the exact same practices. When you see the way in which they keep gerrymandering the electoral system to help themselves, that goes beyond, I dislike the immigration policy, I dislike whatever Mr. Orban thinks about various things. It is an attack on any real sense of democracy. And if we blind ourselves to that, I think we're blinding ourselves to one of the most urgent problems in the heart of Europe right now. Okay, thank you. Yes, I'm going to give the last word to Celia. Well, I just want to jump in on something that was mentioned earlier, which is immigration. Um, I'm afraid I disagree again. Uh, it's um, not on the worrying uh, fact of uh, how to handle migration waves and the climate migration will be a big question out there. But I do disagree that uh, on the fact that we, we cannot deny uh, that geography does play a huge role, that uh, Europe cannot shield itself, that we cannot let people drown in the sea. That is just not okay. And we should fight back and denounce those policies. And in a way, no a politician has been creative enough and, and brave enough to be able to really be forceful in just stating the fact, the fact is that Europe cannot shield itself from these immigrants, that it has to find a way for a family grouping because it's just part of the civil rights of citizens to, to live uh, in mobility, that it has a long history of colonization for all of these reasons. Migration is just part of public policy. And it will happen. And the only way to push back on the populace is to have a real platform, maybe even go to the point of having a pro-immigration platform. In the US, you have a presidential candidate, Beto O'Rourke, that is making that exact same point, saying pushing back on Donald Trump will not be by uh, just going around the issue, but just facing it head on and just recognize the value of the migration issue. So I, I think it, it, it needs to be at the center of the conversation, uh, including taking risky positions. Thank you, um, Celia. And to all of you, please join me in um, thanking this wonderful panel. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.